Hi everyone! It's been a long time, hasn't it? I've had a pretty busy semester, but now that it's summer, I'm ready to start producing again. And what a way to get back into it with a monster biology of the Emperor. So let's waste no time and dive right in. Question for you. Do you think that the Emperor is fat? I thought so too. Turns out that all that bulk is a facade, a mere ruse that hides the troubling fact that Entbrats are built like bodybuilders underneath a layer of fat. Let's start unpacking this discovery by looking at some questionably canon evidence. It is an official My Stinging Monsters post, but it may not have been created with the intention of a crazy YouTuber poring over every detail. <laughs> On the card, it lists that the Entbrat is, on average, 6 feet 5 inches and weighs 307 pounds. For the record, the healthy weight for 6 5 person is generally agreed upon to be between 150 to 220 pounds. You can find a lot of charts online that vary between that general scope of weight. We can also plug the Entbrat's data into a body mass index calculator and discover that its BMI is 36.4. This is considered not just overweight, but obese, as the optimal BMI should be below 25. So right now you might be scratching your head and wondering why the heck I started the episode off like that. According to Monster Handler Tyson in one of his Quick Questions episode, the monster can eat 641 pounds of food a day. That's over twice its weight in food. Of course, factoring in the evidence that all monster food is highly nutritious and vegan, it has led me to believe that the Entbrat has an incredibly high metabolism to absolutely shred all of that food it's constantly shoveling in. It's like how a panda is constantly eating. Except for the panda, bamboo isn't very nutritious, and it needs to constantly eat to get enough energy to live. How is the Entbrat putting away all of this high-quality food? It's almost as bad as when Roy was the first one to the charcuterie board. Hey! The more muscle mass an organism has, the higher their muscle density is. To keep their muscles fed, they need to eat more food. This is a very simplified explanation of high metabolism. To see high metabolism in action, let's look at different species of gorilla. They weigh 400 to 500 pounds, average 6 feet in height, and eat up to 75 pounds of plants and fruit a day. 75! On a human BMI calculator, they are considered even more obese than the Entbrat. This is why I don't think it's appropriate to use human health statistics on the Entbrat. Maybe we can invest in a body mass index scale for large apes. At any rate, the Entbrat is powering through eight and a half times the amount of food a gorilla eats. It's safe to say that it has incredible muscle mass and density. He's not fat, he's just bulking. With the question of diet answered, we can now talk about the Entbrat's plant parts. It is a combination of both plant and animal, evidenced by the leaves growing on the collar and the arms, and his tongue and his teeth. When you cut an ant brat, does it bleed? It's a valid question! I was debating whether to give the ant brat plant cells or animal cells on the inside. If it had plant cells, the internal anatomy would look like a tree, and it would use sap instead of blood. However, given the fleshiness of the mouth, which indicates the flow of blood underneath, I went with animal cells. Even so, the Entbrat does have plant cells in the leaves and horns that integrate into its body plan, making it both plant and an animal. A planimal, if you will. When I was in grade school, I was told that heterotrophs, organisms that eat food, and autotrophs, organisms that produce their own food, were two separate classes. Nowadays, we found numerous examples of animals that work in very close proximity with plants in a symbiotic relationship. In these cases, the plant gives sugars from photosynthesis to the animal. While not technically a planimal, the organism does use sunlight to generate energy for itself while also eating regular food with its mouth. In most of these symbiotic relationships, animals use algae in their skin to photosynthesize in a process called kleptoplasty. Other animals use zooxanthellae, which are similar to, but a bit different from algae. They achieve the same purpose. Notable examples of photosynthesizing animals include the leaf slug, which is adorable, the spotted jellyfish, which is icky, 
and the yellow spotted salamander, which is the only known vertebrate to harbor algae in its cells. The oriental hornet is a little different than the others, but is still really neat. It uses the pigment in its yellow abdomen spot to absorb sunlight and convert it to electrical energy to power its organs and daily activities. For the ant brat, I wouldn't describe it exactly as kleptoplasty, because the plants are also part of the monster's DNA, and presumably hatch with it out of the egg. The plant parts most likely send sugars into the bloodstream of the ant brat to give it some extra energy, like it needs it. Its Dawn of Fire bio mentions that the ant brat does indeed do this, giving it a secondary means of nutrition. The fur corn most likely shares this planimal body structure, although that might be the only other monster that does so. I suspect most other botanical monsters are completely plant through and through. The octopus, edamimi, flawa, gnarls, vivane, and maybe even the shugafam are probably ambulatory species of vegetation. One last thing about the plant bits of the ant brat. The monster most likely has chloroplasts in its skin cells as well, which is why it's such a vibrant green color. Just like how the green colors of leaves hide their true orange coloration, we can see hints of the ant brat's true skin color around its lips and eyelids. But we'll get more into that discussion when talking about the rare ant brat later today. Another thing that I'm very interested in talking about today is the life cycle of the ant brat. Its younger form is rooted into the ground. The egg of the monster then acts somewhat like a seed. Unfortunately, the science of how my singing monster's eggs work is not fully known yet. We are told that they are more spore-like than egg-like and contain the parent monster's genetic material, but we're a little shaky on the details, like how they physically manifest, or if they contain an embryo inside, or why some are extremely detailed on the outside. Let's skate around that can of worms for now and just picture the egg of the ant brat as a seed. When a real seed is planted, certain soil conditions, like the temperature and moisture, must be met before it germinates and begins to sprout. When it has absorbed enough water, the seed is swollen and cracks open under the pressure. Out of the crack snakes a primary root called the radical, which takes up the role of nutrient and water absorption. In the case of the end brat, the egg is most likely germinated by being buried as well. But instead of one radical emerging, two poke out of the bottom of the egg. These will eventually become the horns of the monster. This is not normally how real plants grow, as they only need one primary root to start. The ant brat's biradical system allows for the seed to grow into its next phase. Like a yolk sac in animal eggs, a structure called a cotyledon provides the initial oomph of energy to get the seed growing big and strong. In real plants, the radical grows so quickly that it often lifts the seed back up out of the ground, where the cotyledon exhausts its nutrients and falls off, leaving space for the first leaves to grow. For the ant brat, the two radicals could push the egg back up out of the ground, where the egg can resume hatching, and the baby monster is left suspended between its horns. As a quick botanical side note, plant seeds often have either one cotyledon or two, known as monocot or dicot plants. The number of cotyledons affect how the plant grows and what its characteristics are. The Enpret is most likely a dicot planimal, as dicots have those large radicals called taproots from which all other roots branch. At any rate, the seedling Enpret would primarily get its nutrients from the soil and the sunlight through its leaves. Eventually, however, the monster grows too large to be supported by its plants alone and becomes ambulatory in search of greater amounts of food. As the young monster grows to adolescence, its tap roots could decay and weaken, allowing the ant brat to uproot itself, adapting what were once its life-giving radicals into sturdy horns. Other than that, the only thing left to talk about is the intelligence of the ant brat, which is not notably high. Mental disabilities are often the cause of below average intelligence, but I don't see any other symptoms that the monster exhibits. The end brat possesses capable motor functions and, albeit simple, understands problems and tries its best to help, as per the Dawn of Fire bio. Plus, I don't believe the entire end brat species would be affected this way, unless their gene pool is incredibly polluted. No, I suspect that the monster merely has an underdeveloped brain. Now, 
ordinarily, brain size does not directly correlate with intelligence. Consider birds like crows and ravens, or bees, that use mathematics to calculate the distance to flowers. Rather, intelligence is linked to the density of neurons and their distribution in the different lobes of the brain. Humans have a very advanced cranial cortex, which gives us mental capabilities above pachyderms and cetaceans, despite our smaller brain size. In the case of the Enbrats, I think they have lysencephaly, which is Greek for smooth-brained. Yes, without the ridges and lumps and the valleys and bumps, the brain lacks enough neurons to give it average intelligence. Fun fact, the koala also has very few folds in its brain, causing the poor creature to be quite dull. Never ask a koala for financial advice. And that's everything I noticed when studying the Enbrat. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. Let's see the diagram. The first thing we notice about the rare ant brat is its vibrant autumnal foliage. In regular plants, chlorophyll is the pigment that gives the leaves their green coloration. As the nights grow longer and the winter sets in, the plants sense the change in the season and begin breaking down the chlorophyll. When we see the leaves turn orange and red, it's because there's no more green pigment to hide the leaves' true colors. These colors are achieved through two types of pigments called carotenoids and anthocyanin. We actually discuss the effects of carotenoids in animals and humans in the Monster Biology episode for Pom Pom, so I recommend checking that one out when you finish this episode. In our case, it seems that the rare ant brat's chlorophyll has already been broken down, revealing its true skin color. Another detail are larger horns which can just be explained as a longer period of growth while a seedling. Some additional roots grew out of the radical taproots and have remained attached to the horns. The last thing regarding the rare is its increased intelligence. According to Rare's research, a series hosted by the Monster Handlers from 2015 to 2017, rare ant brats can count all the way up to seven, which is a seriously big deal for their species. Maybe the rare, with more time to germinate as a seedling, developed a slightly more advanced brain. Either way, an Enbrat individual is as intelligent as your average two-year-old, which is when toddlers begin learning how to count to ten. The epic Enbrat is a rather creepy sight, and I was not prepared for it to look like that when it first released. Because the Enbrat stays indoors all day, the plants on its body do not get enough light to photosynthesize, and they die out. The end breath is fine though, because it can still rely upon energy gathered by eating food. Its horns appear to have withered slightly due to poor treatment, and its pale skin is due to spending time in the darkness and not producing pigments. Its paleness could also be resultant of a decreased blood flow from staying inside and remaining inactive all day. This is also evidenced by the epic end breath's noodle arms, it's not exercising like its common or rare cousins. We can also see some darker brownish discolored spots on the head, hands, and sides of the epic. This could be a natural pigmentation display like many other monsters have, but given the fact that we don't see the common or rare Enbrat with these spots, I have a concerning theory. I think that this monster may have dermopathy, which are discolorations on the skin brought about by diabetes. They are most commonly found on the legs, torso, arms, and neck, but they are completely harmless and do not cause any pain. I have reason to believe that the epic ant brat has type 2 diabetes, which is, simply explained, the inability to effectively produce a hormone called insulin that helps regulate blood sugar levels. Although the exact cause for type 2 is unknown, being overweight and inactive are thought to be contributing factors. As we can see, the epic ant brat meets a lot of these criteria. Poor guy should probably start going to the gym. Well, on that off-putting note, 
I do believe that is everything I wanted to speak about today. Thanks for staying with me until the end, and subscribe if you want some more monster biology. This has been your host, Wiblix the Wobox, and I will see you all later.